what does professionalism mean to you? According to the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, who we are, that first core um, propositions, we scroll down the page and we get five propositions of how teachers best teach. Most of these are pretty standard. Proposition number one, teachers are committed to students and their learning. Duh. Proposition two, teachers know the subjects they teach and how to teach those subjects to students. This has been an area of concern for a lot of people lately, but I think it needs to be said again. Duh. Proposition three. Teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning. Have we heard of progress monitoring? Not going to say it again. Number four. Sorry, there's four. Teachers think systematically about their practices and learning from experience. Okay, so take your personal experience or the student's personal experience, which is better, and plug it into their learning so that they're more well-rounded. But the one I want to draw your attention most to is, drumroll please, proposition number five. Teachers are members of a learning community. That means that everything that you do in the community or out, which includes the internet community, building it to the world community, because these are world learners and world student citizens, it affects their learning. So be wary, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm sure, as discussed in this article, bloody second jobs, educators create slasher slash nudity films, the film Sli Slicing Beauty has full nudity and lines such as let me out of here you effing crazy b and you know what those words mean that is not professionalism swear words twice in one sentence full nudity in an underage classroom is not acceptable but this was somebody's out of school entertainment and fun so should we be regulating it or not it seems as though from the second half of the article filmmakers that the various films that were made by moon goyle incorporated were not the highest of quality it talks about nudity it talks about voyeurism fetishism um the last line of the article is talking about girls and actors going to a strip club girls strip it's genius i don't see where it's genius that girls taking off their clothes for money but maybe i'm out of the times and i got this from the hartford current not the new york times but um <laughs> but Moongoil doesn't seem to be the most artistically creative. Some of the storylines are actually very interesting, which you can read about in the article. But is it appropriate for kids to watch? And that's the issue in that article. Well, I found some sources that talk about viewing films in class and how they can be used in your classroom. ReadWriteThink.org has been a great source of information for teachers to use. Cover to cover, comparing books to movies, has some ideas about how to go about this lesson plan writing. The overview talks about movies being an integral part of the language arts classroom when they are used in ways that encourage the development of students' critical thinking. In this activity, students explore matching texts, novels, and movies adapted from them 
to develop their analytical strategies. They use graphic organizers to draw comparisons between the two texts and hypothesize about the effects of adaptation. They analyze the differences between the two versions by citing specific adaptations in the film version. So, the administration and the Board of Education are concerned about the judgment used to be engaged in such activities while serving as an educational leader. Accordingly, they are looking into the matter and obtaining all the facts. I know how long these investigations take, and it's ridiculous because you know point blank that these videos, once you've viewed one or two or whatever amount was available, they're not appropriate for students to watch. Two, if you look at the fact that the principal used a pseudonym when making these videos, he was trying to hide his identity and yet still be a self-actualized person. And that's important for people to be self-actualized, not just to be focused on one thing or another. If education careers don't pan out, if you get the burnout, you should have something to fall back on. We all talk about fallbacks. It's not just for people who are actors, singers, um, artists, dancers, writers. It's also for the rest of us whose job careers might have to change in 10 years, 20, 30. Right now, my dad is substitute teaching, but for the past 40 years, pretty much, he was in banking. Things change. People change. As the story progresses, we see that the guidance counselor was also placed on leave. But does that mean it was necessary for them to be placed on leave? Can they have something that's just for them? And could they have used their pseudonym to protect themselves from their students seeing this? Did they actually view this in the schools or was it just a sideline? So far, none of the articles said that anybody has viewed these in classrooms. In the editorial, Too Creepy for Schools, one of the authors, I'm not sure which one actually wrote this, said that it was not appropriate for schools, but there's no overlap here. And that's an important distinction to make, because when there's no overlap, how can they be at fault for doing something on their own? Using a pseudonym. Do you remember teaching um, Samuel Langhorne Clemens? No, nobody remembers that name. Well, I did a project on him. Samuel Langhorne Clemens is Mark Twain. Mark Twain is his pseudonym. He chose it because he was in love with the sea and it means the point at which a boat can go into the water and not touch the bottom of the sea. That is its Mark Twain.